old-fashioned way, I get to hear my favorite sound, the rustling of pages. We get to do that today. I love that sound. So open your Bibles up. I'll give you a head start to, uh, before I get going. Isaiah, we're going to start off in Isaiah 66. All right, before I get there, though, I want to make a couple announcements. Well, one mainly. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's good, good morning. I hope you all are having a blessed day today. Um, what we're going to do, we were supposed to have a baptism today, but we're going to move it to next week. I have one definite and three possibilities. If you're interested in being baptized, you won't be alone. There will be at least one, maybe four, maybe more. So um, I know I preached on it last week, so if you have any questions, I would, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. So, all right. Now, what we're going to do today, I didn't get any change today from uh, the last two weeks. I was supposed to be preaching on um, the all of God, so we're going to do that again. This is only our second, even though it's week four, it's only our second sermon on that. So... Week four, the topic was, is our response to God's Word. So, our response to God's Word. And I wanted to give a quick testimony of what God's Word has done for me, personally. And, and again, God's Word has the power to save you. I know that because that's how I got saved, through God's Word. And the God's Word even says that, that it has the power to save God's Word had the power to free me from the grip of fear. If you struggle with fear, God's Word, His promises, I, I just etched them in my heart and my mind, and it just helped me overcome fear. God's had, Word had the power to set me free from panic attacks, um, which is kind of related to fear, so that's just a result of fear. But God's Word, and through His Scriptures, that's how I, every morning, you know, and I still do it, God's Word had the power to help me overcome addictions. No matter what you're going through, what, what addictions you're going through, you can have, through the power of God's Word, it can help you through the addictions. God's Word has given me peace in time of distress or stress, whatever you want to call it, tribulations, trials. You can have peace through that too. God's Word taught me who God is so I can know Him. You know, if we don't know God's word, we don't know who God is. You know, we that's how we why we why we continue to read daily because we want to know more of God. We want to get to the depth of, of of knowing who God is. God's word taught me to of my identity in Christ, and that's really important. If you don't know who you are in Christ, then you might believe you are through what other people tell you who they, who you are, but but God's word clearly tells you you need to know your identity in Christ. Uh, God's Word helped me to help others in time of need. That's how I help people, through God's Word. When people come to me for counsel, I use God's Word to counsel them. God's Word taught me the power of prayer. You know, I, I mean, God's Word is so powerful teaching on prayer, and then you get to actually witness it through praying. God's Word has taught me that nothing is impossible for Him, that God is the God of the impossibilities, and he can, he, can, he can do anything. You know, he's God, right? God has taught me about my eternal destiny. I know where I'm going. I know who, again, the Bible clearly gives a description of, of heaven and what it's going to be like in our glorified bodies. And I could go on for the whole service because that's how powerful God's word is. All this is great, but how we respond to God's word and that's what today we're going to look at. How do we respond to God's Word is how we truly get the victory in, in this life, in our walk with Jesus. Because we can know a lot of things, but if we don't put application to it, then it's just knowledge. And knowledge without application, what does it say? Knowledge puffs up. You know, it can just puff up, and you can just use it like the Pharisees did to beat people down. And that's not what the Word of God is for, to beat people down. It's, it's to... Uh, help us to understand the depth of God's love for us, for you and I. So, today we're going to look at five ways to respond to God's Word based on our teaching this week from the All of God. 
So I'm going to first read Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Uh, the title of today's sermon is How to Respond to God's Word. That's just what we're going to, we're going to look at five ways how we're to respond to God's Word. So we're going to start off with this awesome scripture in Isaiah. And it says in Isaiah 66, Thus says the Lord. When you hear, thus says the Lord, now your antennas should be up. If God's speaking, this isn't not Paul speaking. This isn't you, a friend of yours speaking. This is God speaking. When thus says the Lord, we need to take heed and listen to what he's got something important to say. That's what God, that's what he does. So here we go. Heaven is my throne. And we know where Jesus is seated where? Seated where? At the right hand of the Father, he is sitting at the throne of grace, where, how we pray. Our prayers go directly to heaven. And the earth is my footstool. God is sovereign. He's in control. Even though it looks like the world's out of control, this is all part of his plan. From Genesis to Revelation, we're, we're heading into Revelation. Those of you who read, read, uh, read Romans 1 realize that God... I mean, America, as we know it, if we look at it, America is under the judgment of God right now. And we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. Buckle your seatbelts because it's going to get crazy, okay? When it, where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? Question marks like, God, and, and then God explains, for all these things my hand is made. God has made all these things. And all these things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look, this, on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. In other words, to simplify, that means humble, those who are humble, and who tremble, trembles at, at my word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have created everything, Lord. You have given us so many blessings, Lord. Physically, spiritually, we you know we have every 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 spiritual blessing from the heavenly realms, Lord. We you have blessed us immensely, Lord. And Lord, you favor, you look down upon your people who are humble and who are who tremble at your word, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you just open our hearts up to receive your word today, Lord. Help us to uh, get a better understanding of what it means to respond to your word, Lord, as you speak to us through your word. So, Lord, today, just uh, draw us closer to you, that we would take this time to focus on you and take away the distractions that we have, Lord, that we can just be attentive to you, your word, and, and the Holy Spirit who convicts us and teaches us and comforts us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so, so we looked at um, the trembling of God's word, and God blesses those who tremble at God's word. Look at, and we, I, I'm, I, I'm, look, the screen is not there. Okay, Philippians. So Philippians 2.12. Man, I turned right there. I can't believe it. That ain't going to happen every time. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Okay? So, focus on always obeyed. Always obeyed what? what, what always obeyed what? God's word, right? We're talking about obeying God's word. That's the only way. That's how we know it, through his word. So, if you and I tremble at God's word, we will do what? What did we just read? We will uh, obey it, right? I want to look at two more scriptures here. Proverbs 16.6. 6. Proverbs 16.6. 6. I don't hear the pages. At least let me hear them. All right. Proverbs 16.6. 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord... One departs from evil. Now, this will be easy to find since you're there. Just go make a left-hand turn to Psalms, the book of Psalms in Psalm 112. And this is going to work because I have different translations, so I didn't bring two different Bibles. So 
I'm not going to get what I wanted tonight. Has anybody got an NLT today out there? No NLTs. I, got, uh, I might have to use my phone to look it up because I'm going to read. I got two from NLT. All right, so 112.1 says, praise the Lord. That's what we just did. We praised the Lord through song, right? Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. So there are, now we're going to get to the five distinct aspects of trembling at God's word, okay? Because how we respond to God's word is where the blessing of God's word is. So number one, and we don't have it on the screen, but it's obey God immediately. Obey God when? Immediately. Um, I want you to listen to how Jesus addressed the church at Ephesus. Ephesus. I'll go all the way to the back of the Bible, Revelation, and it's the last book of the Bible, chapter 2. This is an easy one to find. In verse 5, and remember, Jesus is addressing the seven churches. This is the church at Ephesus, the, the church that had did what? What did they do? They, they had lost their first love. Who, who's their first love? They lost, Jesus. They, did, they didn't have put the love of Jesus first. So, so Jesus gave this. He said, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. And do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Okay? To repent means to change. There's a change in the way you think, and then it's a change in the way you act. So we are to obey God's word immediately because Jesus said what? That he would come quickly. Uh, suddenly. That's suddenly. You know, it, so we, we have to realize that. And obey God immediately. Uh, sometimes, you know, when God speaks to us, whether it be through his word, through prayer, or whatever it be, uh, sometimes it's important to respond immediately. Be, for whatever reason, we may not know. And I, sh I just shared with the group, I hadn't talked about this for a long time, I, I, it, it, when we were doing something in Acts, when the church was praying for Peter and he got released from prison, it reminded me uh, how important the immediate factor, while he's praying, immediately he was released from prison. So it made me think of a time when I was up here, I remember sitting up here teaching the book of Acts. We were going through the book of Acts, and the God spoke to me very clearly to stop what you're doing get the church, and go to Joyce's house. No explanation, nothing. And Kim even rem rem remembered the part. I didn't remember this part. She said, you told everybody, just leave your stuff here. We're all going to Joyce's house. And we were in the middle of Bible study, don't know, didn't make any sense to me. But when we got there, she was visibly upset, but visibly thankful to see us. So we got there, we prayed for her, and, and, and um, she didn't share this with me right away, but two weeks later, about two weeks later, she shared with me, I was ready to commit suicide the day, th that night. So she got up here and said, some of you have heard her say it herself, because she has gave that testimony. Um, I think she, I know she did the Parkinson's one, I don't, uh, that one too, I think she did. But, but that was a thing, like if I would have said, say like, I heard God speaking to me, to stop what you're doing and go. Had no clue what was going on at all. But one thing, again, that I told Joyce is this shows how deeply God loves you because as I told the leadership team, imagine if you're ready to commit suicide and your church shows up at your front door. Imagine how that, how I would be like, like that, that only God could do that. That's a God thing. It's not a Paul thing or North Glen thing, that was a God thing. That God loved her enough. God knew what she was planning on doing. And he used the church to help her. That's just an example of when, when God speaks to us to do it immediately. Because you, you just don't, you know, you just sometimes don't understand. And we're going to get a little deeper in that on one of the, one of the sayings. But um, if this church would have not listened to, been obedient to God, what he said, they no longer would have been blessed 
And Jesus would have come quickly and removed their influence as a church. And ultimately they did. Ephesus lost. Ephesus is in ruins right now. So that church is gone now. Not, and I, now I want to use, uh, I can't use my phone because it's up there. Psalm 11960 in, uh, uh, it's really good in the NLT. Has anybody got the All of God book? Because I think it's written there. You got that? Is that? Thank you. All right, so what day is that? That's on day 23, immediately. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying. Here it is. All right, it's on page 145. It says, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. Psalm 119, 60. Okay, thank you. Got one more time. So once we know... The will of God based on God's word, right? We need to immediately obey because it is, God's word is the living word of God. It's alive. It's, it's alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it's something that is not dead. So number one, we obey God immediately. And continuing to examine what it means to tremble God's word, the, the one who truly walks in holy fear will do number two. Obey God even when it doesn't make sense, Right? Even when it doesn't make sense. We all can probably give examples of God's called us to do things that didn't make sense. Just like just the example I just gave you didn't make sense. It would have made more sense. Finish the Bible study, then go visit her. That would have made sense. But no, God sometimes says something, and, and I got some examples here. Because scripture is full of, of things God asked the people to do that didn't make any sense at all. Um, does it make any sense to love those who hate you? That doesn't make no sense. I mean, that, our flesh don't want to do that, right? We don't want to love those who hate you. Does it make any sense to do good to those who mistreat you? No, it, no, it doesn't. Does it make any sense for Jesus to spit into the dirt and put it on the eyes and said, go clean it off? And what did it do? It, it healed, healed his blindness, right? That, that didn't make sense. Why, go wash it off now. I, I, put the spit, I put the mud on you, now go wash it off. And um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And, and I think about Jericho, you know, marching around, singing, and, and, and doing what they did, and, and the walls came down. You know, that, that, that's something that didn't, doesn't make sense. There's a lot of things in the Bible that don't make sense. All right, look at one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And this is um, something that I have to live every day. That... Um, I think about it, I, I have to, and it's a good thing to do this. It's trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. And lean not on your own what? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And what's the promise? And He shall direct your paths. That's a promise. So when we trust Him with all our heart and not try to figure it out ourselves, some things we're never going to figure out on this side of heaven. But we have to trust in the Lord. The Lord's wisdom far exceeds yours and I's, doesn't it? And therefore, we shouldn't depend on our own understanding. And I can't understand a lot of things in this life, and I guarantee you all can't either. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to understand things in this life. But the person who fears God obeys him, even if it doesn't make sense. You know, sometimes things just don't make sense. I want to ask you a question. Do you have trouble trusting God's wisdom? Do you constantly lean on your own understanding? Do you, are, are you constantly trying to figure everything out? Um, you can drive yourself crazy if you do, but lean not. Do not lean on your own understanding. His ways are higher than our ways, right? So the one who walks in holy fear will, will number two, obey God even if it doesn't make sense. When we tremble at God's word, we will do number three. Number three is, Obey God even when you don't see a personal benefit. Sometimes doing God's word is not going to, obeying God's word is not going to have a personal benefit. The church today has come a lot of what can you do for me. We talked about this in leadership meeting too. We have become a me first society. Uh, think, about, think about this. If I stood up here and told you of a major change or any, it's your job, a major change, the first thing you're going to think of how does this affect me? 
That's just a natural way to do it. We think about how it's going to affect me. I've learned this from my job because before I became a pastor, when, when my company stood up there and said there was going to be a major change, I always did the same thing, thought about how does it affect me. Well, now I go a little deeper. Well, I'll go to my boss and say, explain why you're changing what you're cha changing. You know, let me, you know, because there's, a re there's always a reason. We can't, just like sometimes I may make changes in the church, it might not work for your ministry or for you, but it, it might be best for the overall, you know. Um, so we have to be careful about how we respond to change and not always look at for a personal benefit. So because actually coming to this church shouldn't be what can this church do for me, but is this the church God's calling me to serve? That's more of what your, uh, that's the mature way. That's not the way I used to look at it. I used to make a list, top 10 list. I'd, I'd rate the pastor, the, the people, the music. I had a rating system and it, and it was over. I'd rate them. Then I'd go to the next church and rate them and, and see how they did. You know, so what was that all about? That was all about me. You know why I wound up becoming a member of North Glen? Because I seen a need in this church back when I was a young, very young man, when I was here, when I first came here, I seen they had a need. The first thing I did was work with the youth because I liked playing ball with the kids and doing stuff like that. And, you know, I wasn't a good teacher at the time, but I loved teaching and playing and doing stuff with the kids. I, that, that was what I did. Um, so we need to ask the question, how can I serve God in this church. If this is the church God's calling you to, then he has somewhere for you to serve. That's why there's some people that w wear two, three, four hats because somebody's not serving, you know. So you have a gift. We all have spiritual gifts. Tony talked about it. And it, it might not be to your personal benefit. You might be doing it just to help others. The gift of helps is, a help, is, a, is much needed. We see that on days that when we go out here to the food pantry. I had a guy at my work, uh, he's one of the bosses or whatever upstairs. He, we, I was talking to my boss and he happened to be in the, in the vicinity and he said, said something about the church because he was asking me where my church was. I told him where it was. He said, I know exactly where it is because he lives in Heritage Hills. He said, you got that, all them people there for, for food there. He noticed that. I said, yeah, hey, why don't you come and help us? You know, c come and help. I said, you're welcome to help us. But um, anyway, um, I want to read Psalm 19, so you ain't got far to go. We were just in Proverbs, so all you got to do is make a, a left-hand turn to Psalm 19, and I'm going to read verses 7 to 11. Listen to this. I love this. Really good stuff. 19, 7, 11. All right. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. See? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord, still talking about his word, are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yeah, than much fine gold sweeter than honey and the honeycomb moreover by them your servant is worn and in keeping them there is great reward great reward you can never outgive god you can never outgive god you god is just his blessings are endless you know you know sometimes and, and i don't like talking about money much you all know that but i'm just going to talk about it for a second you know, when it comes to money, sometimes we have a tight fist. We, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. And we hold on to it. We hold on to everything we got. But once you release it and learn to let it go, God's going to bless you back more than you can imagine. It doesn't make sense. There's another thing. It's not a personal benefit for us to give back to, to his church, back to God. That's not a personal benefit. We do it because we love God. We do it because we're being obedient to God. We do it because we want to see the church flourish. We, 
And, and I'm not going to read all the scriptures about giving and all, but I think sometimes you're holding back the blessing of God by holding on so tight. You know, you have to let, sometimes you've got to let it go to receive. Again, you're not going to ever, 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 ever outgive God. I don't care what you give, whether it be your time, talent, or treasure, you're not, you are going to be rewarded. You're going to be, God's going to take care of you, and he's going to bless you through your obedience to him, through whatever you do, no, no matter how menial it may seem. You might not be getting the accolades and all the things, uh, but you're doing it for, unto the Lord, you know, and, and do it in a way that he sees what you're doing. You know, we don't have to do every. Some people do things behind the scene, and then nobody ever sees what they do. But God sees it, right? Okay. Um, the book used Esther as an example of this, and I thought it was a great example. So I want to go to Esther. Um, and Esther, Esther would be if you you're going to make a left hand turn. And we were in Job a lot. It's right next to Job, right next door to him, so that will help you find it. Esther 4, 11 through 16. Listen to this. All the king's servants and all the peoples of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has, been, who has not been called, he has, he has but one law, put all to death. So you see the severity of this? If you just go into the king's courts, you're, you're gonna, you could die. This is, this is, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter. If the, if the king don't hold the golden scepter out, you're gone. Okay? So you don't play, this isn't something to play with. That they may live. Yet I myself, Esther, have not been called to go into the, ki to the king these 30 days. So Esther is acknowledging the fact that she has not been called by the king to go. So therefore... If she goes, she could die, right? So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to, to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I love that because we're all called for such a time as this. You know, we're all, you know, we're all in a unique place to where we can help people. And um, only God, God's got someone out there that needs your help, that needs you to do something, something for him for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who were present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will, will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. That's courage, isn't it? That's courage to um, sometimes... We're called to do things that might be life-threatening. You know, it could be. It could very well be. There's a lot of people in the mission fields that have been called to the mission field. Their life is in jeopardy every day. That's why it's good to pray for our missionaries, because some are in harm's way. Uh, but they felt, felt the call to go, so they went. Esther felt the call to, do, to go before the king, even though knowing this could be the, be the end for her. So... Holy fear motivated Esther to put God's kingdom above her personal welfare. So sometimes uh, we have to let go of our comfort, our security. Uh, you know, we all like security. That's one thing. And we like comfort. We, we don't like being out of our comfort zone. We don't like to be in We like security. We like the security that, that we have. But all likelihood, our security comes from who? Comes from God. You know, um, we can think we have a secure job, a secure this, secure that, but it can be taken away from you in a, in a, in a New York minute. Okay? So, there was nothing in, in it for her personally, but what was important to God was most important to her. So, Esther trembled at God's word. She feared God over man, what, God, what man can do, because 
the, the, Jesus even said that do not fear man because man can kill the body. Yes, they can, we can be killed the body, but, but not the soul, right? Not the soul, not, not what goes on forever. Uh, I want to go to Matthew, make a right-hand turn, go to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew 16. And can we hear them pages? Yeah, does it sound good? Let me make it. Matthew 16. Ain't heard that sound in so long. Well, we do on Wednesday nights, but it's only a few of us. It's not 16, 24 through 26. Listen to Jesus. Then Jesus said to his disciple, If anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and do what? Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, so when we tremble at God's word, we will, let's go to number four. We will obey God even if it is painful. Now this is the hard, this is a tough one. Even if it was painful. We're talking about, can be pain, pain and suffering. It could, could, uh, could very well be involved with this. Let's go to Philippians 2.8. Just keep going right to the, to the shuns, the Philippians, Ephesians, you know, all them shuns there. They're, they're all together. Galatians. So we're going to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And it says, And being found in appearance as a man, speaking of Jesus here, what did Jesus do? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Jesus willingly obeyed the Father's request of the cross, even though it would cause Jesus great pain and suffering. And I want to read... Go back to the left, to back to Matthew, back to the beginning of the New Testament. And I want to read Matthew 26. I want to read this account in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus, um, th this was painful. This was, you're going you're gonna to hear the words, how painful, painful it, it was for him. And Jesus, uh, Matthew 26, 36 through 39 says, and Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took, the, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he, be, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So Jesus was sorrowful and deeply distressed. Okay? And then it goes even deeper. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. This is Jesus. Exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup, that cup represents suffering, that cup of suffering, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And look at Luke 22. Um, Matthew didn't put this in there, but I, 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 I wanted to. Matthew 22, 44. Make a right-hand turn a couple books down the road. 20, Luke, I'm sorry. Luke 22, verse 44. L listen to this. And being in agony, speaking of Jesus, he was in agony. You ever been in agony? We've been in agony. We know what agony is like. It's horrible, isn't it? And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. So next time you're in agony, maybe take it from Jesus and pray a little more earnestly. Just really get deep in your prayer. You know, instead of having a pity party, maybe get down and, and just start praying earnestly like Jesus did. Here's how earnest he, he was praying. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'm telling you, that's something that none of us have experienced, that kind of distress and agony 
We've been through a lot. All of us have been through a lot, but not there where Jesus was. Jesus was in great conflict between obedience and self-preservation. You know, he was in great, uh, the emotional pain was so intense that Jesus was sweating great drops of blood. The, and I'm telling you what the, the mainly was from was from the separation from the Father. The separation from the Father, he had been with him from, from beginning, from, from time, for, for, for etern all eternity. He had always been with him. Just the thought of Jesus being separated because he's going to take on the sin of the world, that is where the agony was from. More so than the, the beatings and the crucifixion, that, that was bad, but nothing compared to how many want to understand sometimes emotional pain is a lot worse than physical pain. That emotional pain that Jesus was experiencing, emotional pain that, that just the thought of the separation from the Father, the thought that, that he was going to have to take on the sin of the world, a sinless man was take, going to take on all our sin. So, and not to mention the physical pain, I don't want to downplay that, because he was beaten, he was, he was mocked, he was spit on, he was, he was crucified. So, he went through physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, even more so, spiritual suffering, the separation of the Father. All right, let's go to 1 Peter 4. Um, go right towards the end of the Bible. It's almost to the end. 4, 1 through 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for who? For us in the flesh... Here's what you're supposed to do, church. The same thing Jesus did. Arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So we are to arm ourselves. And then verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his, rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Peter tells us to arm ourselves in our suffering. When you're suffering, arm yourselves. As it says here, with the same mind of Christ, have that same mindset. Have look again, just like obey God, even if it is painful. It, it, it's Jonah. Uh, just another example. Jonah ran away because he he hated. The, uh, he didn't want to go where God called him to go. So what did he do? To Nineveh. What did he do? He ran the opposite direction. But he, we, we sometimes do the same thing in our suffering. We just run the opposite way. The fear of the Lord is what arms us, right? And some of us are suffering right now for various reasons. And the pain is intense. It can be very intense. And, and, and you don't know what to do next. You know, you ever get to the point where you don't know what to do next? You know, that, that's, a, that's a, a hard place to be. I, I can remember saying it like success and like it was like part of my speech every day to the Lord. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know what to do. You ever, you ever been in that situation where I just don't know what to do? I don't know what to do next. I don't know what to do next. Praying Jesus' prayer, I think it's a wise thing. Not my will, but your will be done. In intense suffering, Jesus is going through intense suffering. He used that. So I want to use um, the NLT again. So i got to look in the book here. Um, we're on number day four. So what that day would that be? No obvious benefit, no painful. All right, so hopefully it's written out in here. If not, then just gonna, here it is. For, this is 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. So, so we arm ourselves by the holy fear to obey God, even if it means we will suffer in the process. And that brings us to the last one. Uh, the final thing we are to walk in the holy fear of God by trembling God's word is, Number five, obey God to completion. So the, uh, we're gonna, he used the example of King Saul, uh, the first king of Israel, King Saul. Um, 
He stayed away from, he strayed away from obedience when it didn't make sense. The benefit wasn't obvious or it didn't serve his purposes. His lack of holy fear caused pain and harm to others, okay, because he wasn't obedient. So we're going to look at that. We're going to go to 1 Samuel, and that is all the way towards the beginning of the Bible. I'll tell you how I re remember 1 Samuel. It's 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Samuel. They kind of go right together. So I try to look for things to help me get there quickly um, over the years. That just a way you can help. Um, not everybody can memorize all 66 books of the Bible. Um, so listen to this, 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3. Uh, Samuel, a prophet, um, also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Remember, Israel wanted a king. They, they didn't want the judges. They wanted, they wanted, king. They wanted king. So um, this is what they got. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. So we got, now we got our ears up now. I will punish Amulek, Amulek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go attack Amalek and utterly destroy, listen to this, all that they have. This was God's words, destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So that's pretty, pretty serious here, ain't it? So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tehom, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Oh, I'm, I'm going too far. Then I, go to, I want to go to verse 9 to 11. I want to skip some. But Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep. So he, 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 he spared the king, King Ag Agag. He spared him. He spared the best sheep, the oxen, the fattings, the lambs, and all that was good. He got rid of the bad stuff, but he kept the good. And were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, listen to this, this is pretty serious. I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as a king. Now, that's not a good thing. Now God, God's against it. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. So um, King Saul disobeyed God's command because of his lack of holy fear. He, he again, for whatever reason, he thought for personal gain or whatever, just to look good for the people, he saved a lot of good things, right? So maybe it looks good to a lot of people. Probably look good to man. Like, hey, look, we got all this extra good stuff. Go fast forward to verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. So we know that that was the end of King Saul, right? As king. So God is calling his church, Northland Community Church and all churches, to finish well in these last days. And I know I read a little bit, but... Jesus' seven letters to the church are a great place to start to see what Jesus is looking for in his church. And I've preached through uh, the seven churches, I know at least twice since I've been pastor here, uh, at least twice, and because uh, I love it, and I think it, it's a good picture of what Jesus is looking for in his church. And to study the seven letters uh, that Jesus wrote to the churches, and, they, and they're for today, too. They weren't just for then. They're for very relevant for today, that... Uh, we can know what Jesus is looking for in his church. So I want us to quickly recap what it looks like to walk in holy fear of the Lord as we tremble at God's word. Number one, obey God when? Immediately. Number two, obey God even if it doesn't make sense. Number three, obey God even when you don't see a personal benefit. Number four, obey God even if it is painful and number five, obey God to completion. So I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we help, just help us, Lord, to respond to your word. Lord, to put application to your word. And Lord, just thank you for this, uh, these five 
ways that we can that can help us in our walk with you. So Lord, just uh, pray that you continue to help us to grow in our study of the all of you. Lord, we you we are in all of you, Lord, because you are God and you are uh, our Creator. And, and, and Lord, we we need to be thankful for all things you blessed us in so many ways, Lord. So Lord. Just pray as we continue in this study of the all of God that it would draw us ever closer to you, Lord. And we just give you all praise for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.